Well, why don't we start if the microphone is, is on, and welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm Paul Gewertz, a professor at Yale Law School and also the director of our Paul Tsai China Center. And uh, I'm delighted we're doing this event. This event is part of a formal collaboration that uh, our center has with the uh, John Thornton China Center here at Brookings. It's been uh, a very valuable uh, collaboration, but this is the first in-person event we've had since the relaxation of the COVID restrictions, uh, and it's wonderful to be here to see you and to see colleagues and friends. Um, the topic, as you know, uh, is uh, United States, China, and Europe's different visions of the international order, and we have a group here that's ideally suited for that multisyllabic title. Um, first, uh, and moderating the event, is Ryan Haas, who has recently uh, and splendidly been named the director of the John Thornton uh, China Center here, uh, and he's really a major figure in the field uh, of U.S.-China relations. Uh, and then sitting next to him is Susan Thornton, uh, who is a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center uh, and a, a profoundly important colleague for me and for all of us. Um, and uh, as you may know, she, uh, she joined us um, after serving for over 25 years in the State Department and retiring uh, with the title uh, Acting Assistant Secretary for East, East Asia and, uh, and the Pacific. Um, and uh, um, reflecting Chinese views, I will not say representing China, but reflecting views in China um, is uh, Professor Jia Dao Chung, who is uh, a distinguished uh, professor at Peking University School of International Relations, and he also directs their center on the Global South. Uh, and um, perhaps not for the rest of the world, but for me, uh, another very important fact is that he is currently a visiting scholar at our China Center. He's been in residence since August, uh, and um, just such a valuable colleague to have. And, and finally, um, um, again, not, uh, uh, not representing uh, Europe, but reflecting the perspectives of Europe, uh, we have uh, Tara Varma, who is a visiting, uh, visiting fellow here at Brookings, but prior to that, uh, or and prior to that, for quite some time was the Paris director of the European uh, uh, Center on uh, Foreign Relations. And so we've got a terrific group, and um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ryan Haas and look forward to hearing uh, what everyone has to say. Well, Paul, thank you for your introduction, but even more so for your leadership of uh, the Yale-Brookings partnership. Uh, we've been very enriched by, by the collaboration and, uh, and feel very rewarded to have you as a partner in, uh, in today's event. As Paul mentioned, today's event is intended to look at where there's convergence and divergence in views between Europe, the United States, and China on the future of the international system. And we are going to forego opening presentations to jump right at the heart of these questions. And uh, we're going to start with Susan. So Susan, in a few sentences using plain English, <laughs> What is the international system? It's a subject of definitional imprecision. People invoke it often, but rarely uh, define what exactly it is that we're talking about. And I have, what, three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you used the term international system because that's the one that I, I guess I'm the most comfortable with trying to describe um, in three sentences. Um, 
you know, the, the international system, I think what we're talking about for those of us in this room in our discussion is, you know, the system established after World War II, uh, you know, designed to, in large part, try to prevent another cataclysmic conflict between major powers from breaking out, but also uh, to protect smaller powers uh, from predatory actions by larger powers. And, um, you know, it's a set of institutions and agreed rules uh, to try to promote stability, prevent conflict. I mean, we had, as part of the international system, laws of war that actually predate the setting up of the United Nations, um, the Geneva Conventions, Hague Conventions, etc. But then uh, with the founding of the UN after World War II, um, layers of institutions that are designed to try to preserve peace and try to promote stability. Uh, of course, the international system also, uh, after World War II, part of the idea was to uh, promote reconstruction, the financing for reconstruction of war-torn economies, and to promote commerce and development. And so we set up uh, a number of institutions known as the Bretton Woods Institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, um, uh, the WTO, World Trade Organization, to try to facilitate um, this kind of uh, global prosperity. And I think, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, questions about how well the system is working. One of the bedrock principles has been this principle of territorial integrity, which means that borders of internationally recognized sovereign states should not be changed through use of force, um, which was a principle that was well observed for, um, for most of the last uh, 75 years. And... Uh, has done a good job, I think, in preventing interstate conflict, but of course was was violated um, very obviously and egregiously by Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. And Russia being a permanent member of the UN Security Council, I think that has really kind of given rise to probably the panel we're having here today, which has, has shaken a lot of people's faith, I think, in the system. I mean, the U.S. has played an outsized role in this international system, um, we have provided the leadership. Pax Americana, of course, has provided a lot of the um, stability of the system through uh, multiple alliance relationships and a lot of military deployments. Uh, we've also, I think, promoted global prosperity on the back of kind of open trade flows, open markets, um, and, and commerce, um, and financial flows, capital flows. So I think, um, you know, we have played a leadership role. I guess one of the things we're going to talk about is, is whether uh, that is going to continue or whether that should change. My basic bottom line is that the international system has brought us an awful lot of good. It's being heavily criticized now, but uh, we should not um, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, thank you. We will get to the criticisms in a moment, but first I want to give uh, Jada Jiang or Tara a chance to offer any additions or amendments to Susan's definition of what the international system is that we're talking about. Does it need a new definition? <laughs> if it's international, it's by nature evolutionary. By nature, it invites, um, it has to accept um, contributions and contest of different views to uh, be self-sustainable. I would think, I don't have one, the f one point I would want to say that uh, the international system as was, if we benchmark that with the UN-based system has served Chinese interest extremely well. And um, most of the uh, principles, the core, of the uh, UN treaties are quite in line with the Chinese uh, statements on the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Although uh, that those five principles originated in India uh, and Myanmar back in the 50s, but nevertheless, the Chinese supported that. But there is, there is a bit of a nuance 
in the understanding. If you go back to historical studies, Zhou Enlai would say, well, peaceful coexistence ought not be translated into Chinese as gong chen. Uh, I don't, not many of you here speak uh, Chinese. I don't need to write, I don't have a board to write it. Now, gong chen would be more in line with the Khrushchev uh, reference to coexistence, meaning um, fine, you know, uh, war would be an option uh, between even major powers. Let's prepare for that if you look at the uh, nuclear arms race. But the Chinese wording for peaceful coexistence is gong chu, chu, xiang chu. We have differences, but nevertheless, we have to uh, cohabit, you know, accept the, the, the reality that we're cohabiting one universe. And I would think that nuance is often lost, and to the extent, it, partly because of the Cold War and partly because of uh, um, the uh, power of rhetoric, um, the sometimes nuance is lost in translation. A third, I, this is not a correction. Um, now, if you read some of the literature, especially the media, uh, there seems to be sharp or uncompromising differences between Chinese and American preferences for the international system today. Um, I don't think that is reflective of uh, the realities. Uh, you have what's said, you also have what's not said. I would uh, invite more attention to uh, looking at or examining Chinese views by asking the question, what are they benchmarking against? Against uh, which historical precedents or against what kind of ideal, rather than just taking some expressions at the superficial level, especially uh, uh, by accepting the translated works into English. Or, you know, we have the same challenge of having, uh, the translating uh, English or other foreign languages into uh, the Chinese. So the, uh, if I bring myself to some sort of closure at the beginning, I do not think, I do not believe there ought to be that kind of uncompromising rivalry, uh, either or, uh, between China and the United States, or for that matter, China and the rest of the world. Well, we will get into this more later, but it is interesting that your comments suggest that China benefits and sees value in the international system as oh. it's currently configured, which runs counter to uh, some of the prevailing views in Washington today that suggest that uh, the liberal nature of the international system is a direct threat to China, and China, therefore, is hostile towards it. But, but Tara, how, how are you thinking about this? I would say the Europeans largely share um, uh, the definition that Susan presented to us. Um, the legal res resolution of conflict is something that Europeans care very much about. The foundation of the European Union is a peace project. The idea that sworn enemies are supposed to overcome their differences, sometimes their hatred of one another, through trade, through cooperation. So I think the idea that actually we have to work together in an international setting, people here call it the international order. Europeans like to call it the multilateral order which is a bit of a semantic difference, but I think that's mostly what it is. I, I do think that with China, we have a bit more of a difference. Um, in, in 2019, the European Commission came up with this idea of almost a holy trinity of what the European Union's relationship with China should be, which holds under systemic rival, competitor, and partner. And under this idea of systemic rivalry, basically there are two components of it. There's an internal element, um, democracy versus autocracy, to put it plainly, different visions of um, how the economic system should work, different visions of <coughs> whether civil society should play or not a role in how we work together. But there is also an external component to it, and that uh, pertains to how we think of the international order. And so there are questions about verification mechanisms that a number of people in China don't like. They, what we I would say as Europeans and Americans have tried to push with these verification mechanisms, trying to build trust to it through a number of mechanisms. 
ensuring that the more we know, the more protected we will be is something that a number of people in China push back against saying, well, actually, you're encroaching on our privacy, on our rights. And so on, we're seeing this actually play out in a number of, of issues. One of the big issues right now is, of course, arms control. So we see how we're struggling to, to sometimes share a same vision. This being said, the third component of the Trinity is that we want to partner with China. And so systemic rivalry doesn't mean that there should be no link, that there should be no cooperation. We need to think of a number of, of topics, particularly when it comes to the global commons, where there is absolutely space for us to cooperate. Actually, not only is there space, there is necessity for us to cooperate. One of the, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that um, I maybe neglected to mention in my definition because it, it wasn't um, that detailed, but I think Tar brings up this point about the tension in the international system between the principle of sovereignty, right, non-interference in a country's internal affairs, which is a principle in the UN Charter, but which is diametrically opposed to an intention with this notion that the international community has a responsibility to protect people anywhere in the international community from, um, you know, what is considered to be abuses from state power. And then we've seen this tension playing out. Even, I mean, I would say um, it's really come to a head in the, in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union because these issues kept coming up, you know, responsibility to protect um, from the UN in a case where there was a civil strife and, um, you know, attacks on minority groups, et cetera. But it, it comes up also in the, in, in the realm of human rights, which is, um, you know, at issue also, I think, between the U.S. and China and Europe um, in the international system. And so, I mean, this is an area that, you know, is constantly and working on China if any, and, and many other countries. I mean, not just China, but this is definitely at some of the heart of the tensions, I think, in the system now. When uh, this notion of systemic rivalry came out of EU rhetoric, most of the Chinese initial translations, I thought, got it wrong. Actually, I uh, started to write a piece to correct it. They, got it, they misunderstood that as systematic mm. rivalry, mm. Now, what is that system? Um, if there was a reservation or difference about that particular system, system systemic difference, it probably uh, un understood or feared to be a code word for regime change. It's about the domestic governing system of China versus the domestic governing system of, you know, in Europe elsewhere. Uh, we spent some good time to seek clarification with our European colleagues, including via Zooms. <laughs> but now it does seem to me increasingly it's getting clearer. So that speaks about need for uh, further communication. But arms control is a field of itself. At the end of the day, what determines uh, the result of a warfare after it gets started is not weapons. It's human will. Wars take place. They come and go. It's Mao Zedong here, but they didn't got into it. Chairman Mao got that right, right? This, uh, the, it's human will. It's the human choice at some point of time. So arms control is a legitimate topic. It needs to be discussed, but it's a means to a larger end. The larger end is how we... Um, learn to relate to each other and to use arms control as an instrument to reduce tension rather than just arriving at some numerical parity and think, think that's a uh, good indicator of uh, a marker of uh, a peace of mind thereafter. There are going to be differences one way or another that might, may, if you not properly managed, arise to a decision to use arms. So arms control is, yes, start talking, but then it must have the element of how and why you go to that decision of pu pushing the button and launch, and let's try to uh, get ourselves to refrain from doing that. Uh, 
May, uh, what did you say? There was something I saw. The, uh, <laughs> she was talking about the, the tension, tension between, between sovereignty and right to protect and, and human rights. I don't know. I, human rights are important. There's no doubt about it. Human rights in China, in any other countries, are important. Um, the R2P, the document uh, where former Prime Minister Chen Ti-chen participated in the wise men's group, later on were tested, first in Libya. Um, you see, uh, this is whereby political scientists, uh, many of them are better at it. You know, I learned English as a second language, and I learned political science as a very new subject. You have the different, some difference between inter-national relations and the intra-national relations. Now, human rights, if you put it more as in the realm of intranational relations, in other words, each state, each governing entity does have that duty to protect human rights and enhance human rights protection, but then, yes, it's very internationally related. But if there was a Chinese reservation, I don't think it's China alone, by the way, it's that... Uh, Concerns about human rights, how is that better or more productively expressed? Better and productively, uh, the measurement being in terms of seeing actual improvement on the ground, improvement to the group of individuals, especially minorities, women or ethnic minorities, the marginalized. You know, uh, and then how, how, how can that be more effective? Is that... Uh, when you use trade sanctions as a means to say, fine, I sanctioned the regime, I sanctioned the elite, then they, hopefully they would turn around to put, change their behavior towards the uh, poor and the marginalized. Or you think about other means of doing this. Uh, I haven't thought it through. And with the R2P, especially uh, in the beginning with the Libya experiment, uh, I do believe there are lots, there's still a lot of room for discussing if uh, military intervention in the, uh, for the goal, it would be really that effective or that conducive to reaching the goal of improving human rights on the ground. Well, I think that's a fair point that it's worthy of further discussion. I'm not sure if we are going to find the answer today, um, but it, it is an important topic for us to continue. That's a continue good to excuse contemplate. for getting us back to Brookings. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to turn us to another foundational question about the international system. Every year around the time of the UN General Assembly in September, there is a wave of articles and commentaries suggesting that the international system is not fit for purpose. It is not solving the world's problems. I think that uh, that feeling is exacerbated by events in, in Ukraine as well as in Israel. And so I wanted to ask each of you whether or not you agree with that diagnosis, that the, the international system is outdated, it's not addressing the most pressing problems in the world. And if so, what would you identify as the most pressing problems that, that merit uh, further focus and resources? Tara, can we start with you? Sure. I do, I mean, I think it's still up to date in the sense that we haven't found something really better, but we do need to reform it. And we've heard a number of voices now actually making themselves heard much more strongly about the fact that multilateralism is one country, one voice, and that their voices should be heard more. So one institution or one format that I'm thinking of is, of course, the UN Security Council, that clearly is inherited from a period where the power balance was very different than it is now. And Europeans are among those saying, it, first of all, the European Security Council should be extended. We're thinking about a number of countries, Germany, India, Japan, amongst others, who, I mean, every country is important, but these countries act particularly on the international stage. They should be given this voice. There should be more uh, non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. It's not that everything can happen in the UN, but when you think of the international order, <coughs> you do need two main elements. First one is impartiality, and the second is a capacity to act collectively. And as of now, the United Nations is the only institution providing, well, at least supposed to provide these two elements. And I think one of the things that Europeans are pushing a lot more for is actually to make it fit for purpose, to make the UN more representative 
of not just the power dynamics, but of the rights of everyone, because what we're looking at, I mean, we're looking at an increasing number of conflicts, and I'm saying this as we speak, of course, with all the events in the war in Ukraine and in Israel and Palestine, but we're also looking at a number of developmental issues that are not going away. The question of debt, the question of climate adaptation, mitigation, of course, development issues, all these, I mean, we have to find a way not to choose between all these topics, but to make sure that we address all of them and that we address all of them collectively. And so we're seeing also a number of what we call many lateral formats. The G20, the G7 have been extremely active in providing some form of political impetus. We're, of course, seeing the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We're seeing a number of, uh, of formats emerging, which I think speak to the strength, actually, of multilateralism. But these many lateral formats, they work because at one point, they basically are attached to a larger international organization. And so we need both. It's not minilateralism against multilateralism. We need to do all of this together in a larger framework. And this is what the Europeans are pushing for as much as possible. They are a growing voice in the international system, not always fully coordinated, as you know, but I think they're trying to get there. The UN is today is in many ways a victim of its own success. People often forget how tremendous the UN system, under the UN system, humanity has progressed. If you look at the meteorology, if you look at health, if you look at food and agriculture, and you look at uh, uh, what's called the Buenos Aires Plan of Action, that that to uh, technology transfer and cooperation among developing countries. UN specialized agencies and their, you know, have done tremendous jobs of you know, connecting different parts of the world, especially what today is popular vocabulary, Global South, to be self, more self, uh, should we say, to generate more dynamism within their own societies rather than pounding the desk at the you know, very beginning of the UN or the uh, the early origins of uh, the so-called South-South cooperation movement, which to demand concessions or demand compensation. So the UN is fit for purpose. I don't think they, if they hear you, of course, whose purpose, if you think about it, the purpose of the vast majority of the world, the, the UN is quite fit. Now, if you measure that purpose by looking at peace, secure uh, development, and human rights, or for that matter, justice, each of the three categories, um, there, has, there can be some uh, disagreements. But then lots, there's a lot of blame on the UN system that have, especially you know, Security Council resolutions or the debates in terms of Article 5, right, authorization of uh, force to exercise the principle of uh, collective security. But then the end of the day, you think, why do two parties go to war? Whose responsibility is it in the first place? Is it the responsibility of the two direct parties? Or is it that of a third, third parties that somehow are grouped under the UN system? So uh, I would think there is more to look at you know, the, the UN system just by going, by going beyond the UN as a mechanism per se. Uh, if you look at in Asia, there is an organization that sometimes is wrongly, let me emphasize, wrongly laughed at as a talking shop. It functions like the UN. But it's worked miracles, like Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. ASEAN members have tremendous difficult I mean, differences. There are memories of history, the border disputes, A, B, C, and D, long list. But they routinize themselves into interactions, regardless of all these large differences. And what's the deliverable? The deliverable for the region is nobody within ASEAN is talking about war as a choice to resolve those differences. And you have Further on, you can look at the ASEAN centrality, or the ASEAN plus China, ASEAN plus Japan, or even the ASEAN actually helped to have a Japan-China, uh, the South Korea uh, grouping called 10 plus 3. There are lots of things to look at, and there are many other regional 
uh, efforts. So, no, I profoundly disagree as, with statements in the UN not fit per person. It's quite fit. It's how you know different members actually uh, make use of it, and rather than simply outsource the blame to saying, ah, it's all the UN's fault. No, it's not. Sorry. S Susan, what do you think? Is, is okay, the I said, you know, that I think the UN's done a lot in its history to uphold, you know, peace and stability and promote prosperity and that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But there are some areas where we need to do some work. Um, you know, we've got not enough capital flowing to the developing world from the developed world. We've got huge transnational problems that are new and that we haven't really had so much um, on the global scale in the past. Pandemics, the cooperation on the pandemic was abysmal, um, and that is a should be taken as a point of departure for future lessons and maybe even coming up with a, an improved or a better organization to work on these things. Climate change has, is an existential threat to all of us. If we don't do something about that, and it has to be done by the whole world, um, there's no point in talking to any, about any of the rest of it. Uh, you know, I think certainly the failure to prevent outbreaks of conflict, um, you know, we've seen that over the years. But again, if you look at the other side of the coin, in, interstate, your, your use of your phrase, conflict has been, has been really you can count the examples on, on one hand. So I think, you know, the collapse of empires, decolonization, all of these things are wrenching changes, and the UN has done an amazing job. Um, new technologies are going to be another existential threat that we really are not um, set up at all to grapple with. I mean, I do think <clears throat> many lateral formats are, are, can be useful. It, it's criticized as a talk shop. It's 193 what plus members at this point. It's very hard to generate consensus. It's slow and ponderous. There's a lot of um, administrative aspects to it that bother people. But as you say, I mean, talking is, is the way we stabilize, the way we prevent conflicts from breaking out, the way we improve understanding, trite as that may sound. So I think... There are reforms that need to be made. There may be things that need to be added and addressed more effectively. Um, you know, one of the things I would say about, uh, just to answer the criticism about, you know, not enough democracy in the international system, I and mean, we all know that people are talking about the U.S., but, I mean, uh, I have to say, whenever there's a, a fire alarm ringing somewhere in the world... You know, where do people come running? Um, so there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem here, and we've worked really hard with China to get China to answer the fire alarm in the past on some issues and not gotten a lot of response there. China tends to not want to stick its neck out and get involved in mediating disputes that are very thorny and um, are risky to try to get yourself in the middle of. And so, um, I mean, Europe, you know, we had the crisis in the former Yugoslavia. And so, you know, I mean, to some extent, it's the U.S. is going to be the de facto leader of this international system for quite a long time into the future. But we do need to see other countries and other powers stepping up to contribute both ideas, but also resources and action in some of these cases. And I think it's frustrating for those of us on the U.S. side, to hear people constantly saying, you know, the U.S. is always trying to tell people what to do, but then when you try to get other people to get involved, you just kind of come up empty a lot of the time. And I think we're working on that. I think we're trying to move in that direction, but that's another avenue of change that needs to happen. Just quickly on this point, I think Europeans are acutely aware of how central the U.S. is in Europe's case without the... Without the U.S., there is no European security. And so we do look at inconsistencies or changes in the U.S. government actually as very important, sometimes existential to us. And we know that if the U.S. decides to withdraw partially or fully from a number of regions, this will affect us directly. And so I do think that um, when we're talking about a liberal order, we need to think about how the word liberal is also perceived. Uh, we, you know, there are criticism about the fact that it, ha it has 
variable geometry that were some of the criticism about double standards that we have some issues we feel very strongly about and we decide that the international system should support us. Other issues somehow we don't feel so strongly about because they're not on our top priority list. And so we get called on by not just rivals, but also partners in what could be considered as inconsistencies. And so I do, I do want to say this because it is important. And so this is why the multilateral order is so central to the Europeans, because it is one country, one voice. And it defends principles, human rights. It's not just about values, but it's about actual international law principles, something that I, we can get a majority of countries to agree on. So... There are experts in the United States who have identified sort of cardinal pillars of the international system, and these include arms limitation, human rights, freedom of navigation, and territorial integrity. If you look at those four cornerstones of the international system, the United States and China have somewhat differing views on each of them. Or maybe you disagree. Um, but based upon that, is it possible, is it reasonable to expect that the United States and China will be able to comfortably continue living under the umbrella of the international system as it is currently configured? Professor Jai, I think you may disagree, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an academic person. I speak my mind. Good. Uh, my own mind. Well, um, on territorial integrity, as a principle, there is no disagreement whatsoever. But then disagreement comes... Uh, over what you know is the accepted border lines. Uh, I don't think we. This was the time to begin talking about specific situations. Uh, everybody knows what I'm referring to, right? Um, for us over there in China, this is the. A, I would invite especially audiences here in the U.S. to appreciate is that China has some 14 or by some other standards even even more than that nation state as neighbors bordering land and there are still you know that land border demarcation or even drawing the line disputes and they were using different records of history or even within the country especially if you look at china and india right the national government scholars in beijing may, they may be referring having one version of what the border should be like but then in the Tibetan region, and uh, there are different accounts of what the border was like, and recorded even to our own system, different languages. That makes the negotiations or shaping of, of opinion much more complex. So territory integrity is a very, you know, very uh, important, I mean, it's an essential principle, but then it comes down to the, the details of uh, whose version of where the territorial line is, that's one point. Um, human rights, I don't think the U.S. and China is really that different on uh, the uh, uh, human rights as an issue. Like, I don't want to be repetitive. It's what another society can and should do in terms of uh, affecting the real Im improvement of the rights situations of the people, and should you equate one distant voice of a minority group or a protest group as representing the whole. Back in the uh, Cultural Revolution years, you know, China, I'm talking about the 1960s, China used to parade one protest leader of the United States after another one of those parades in China. It's probably because here in the U.S. nobody gained much attention. Um, that was, if you use Chinese uh, vocabulary, um, was it, probably that could be viewed what we did then as an interve intervention in domestic affairs, although the, the civil rights movement in the U.S. were real. And uh, uh, for China to take a stance, was it helpful or not helpful? Uh, I think you got my point. I, uh, uh, what, what's the fourth one? You, you named it four. I forgot. Freedom of, freedom of navigation. navigation. Ah, freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation. Arms limitation. Uh, Human freedom rights, of navigation. Authority. Commercial freedom of navigation is not a problem at all. But it's when the freedom of navigation 
missions conducted, I see a risk of freedom of navigation missions being a precursor to uh, a kind of justification for arms build-up, especially naval forces, just for the sake of it. And a, a sort of, uh, should we say, uh, you can call it emotive response. You know, there are issues of international law, there are issues of norms or the systems like uh, the, uh, what I said, emotive. You know, what I don't want to see is somehow in China or in other parts of the world, you would have that sentiment, fine. Uh, let's someday, let's take the U.S. as an example because it has built the, uh, have the naval capacities to conduct those missions in waters close, close to uh, the landmass of China. Why don't we do the same to the United States? We built naval forces and do a few of those around, let's say, off the coast of Maine. <coughs> Well, what's, what's the closest co coast Hawaii. here? Hawaii. Oh. No, Hawaii here, here. would be, nobody cares. Uh, let's well, say, I, have, uh, I have relatives who live in Alaska. Oh, Alaska. And exactly. there have been Chinese vessels it's near good. Alaska. So. And I see that as a, as a sign of, you know, com conflict, conflict promotion for the sake of it. It's uh, not really that conducive at all. So it, those things need to be more thoroughly discussed and uh, the effective communication ought to take place more frequently. Susan? So I'm interested in what you said about uh, uh, conflict promotion for the sake of it. I mean, I do think the differences are, tend to be focused on and exaggerated, and particularly in our current information environment and against the backdrop of politics and you know the strategic competition and all of the talk about that. I think... Um, I'm not sure I would agree with these four pillars being named, but, for example, look at um, the issue of kind of open uh, commerce, open trade, open uh, capital flows. The U.S. and China have differences on some of these things, some related to the level of development, some related to different ways of, of uh, or sort of probably philosophical visions of how to run an economy. But for the most part, you know, we have a lot of commonality now on this issue, a lot more than we used to have. And I think free commerce and free navigation, there are specific differences about interpretations of unclose, et cetera. Um, actually, one difference is that China can be taken to an arbitral tribunal under unclose because it's a signatory to the treaty and the U.S. cannot be taken to an arbitral tribunal under UNCLOS. But I think mainly what I want to say is that the international system was set up to impose constraints on major powers in particular, but on all powers, uh, but particularly major powers. And, you know, the U.S. and China both bridle at these constraints, and we are both very attached to our sovereignty. We both consider ourselves to be exceptional countries. Um, we have, um, you know, a certain vision of our place in the world and what our ambition is. And so it's, it's going to be difficult within one system to put these two countries together and have them cohabit. But we have to do it. We don't have a choice. Um, you know, a U.S.-China conflict would be an extinction event, as they call it now with AI. I mean, I think it would be an extinction event. So we have to prevent it. We have to cohabit, coexist, whatever word you want to use. Um, and so, you know, there is a lot more commonality. And I think the main thing we should focus on is what is the sort of ethos of responsibility for both our own citizens and for the welfare of the greater global community within our two governments and systems. And then, you know, within that, you can find a lot of areas of commonality. I don't think China's ready to be a leader of the international system. You might have a different view, but I think it's going to be the U.S. for the foreseeable future, based on my experience trying to get China to do more. Um, and so... You know, how is that going to look and how are we going to 
bring in the multilateral system. I agree it's a multipolar world. We're just moving there, you know, in different vectors, fits and starts. But other countries have to come in. How does that look? That change has to happen. But, um, you know, we don't have a choice. We have to we have to find a way to coexist. And I think it will be a mistake not to do it within one global international community because of the salience of those other extinction type events that I mentioned that need actually probably to be addressed on a much more urgent basis than they're being tackled now. Okay, so I have a final question for each of you before we turn the floor over to um, our, our guests. And that is, there's a lot of discussion right now about potential bifurcation or fragmentation of the international system. And so looking ahead 20 or 30 years, when my daughter or son is sitting in my chair asking uh, the same question, will there be a singular international system that resembles what we have today or not? Tara, can we start with you? Sure. Um, fragmentation is something that Europeans are very worried about. Uh, the president of my country, Emmanuel Macron, actually has been giving a lot of speeches about it. Uh, but the idea that we need to fight against the logic of blocks and not go back to a Cold War era, thinking that we need to absolutely make sure that we need to be clear about um, divergences, differences that we have. That's also what the international system is about. But once we've acknowledged them, make sure that we settle these discussions and differences globally together. And so the idea that actually Europeans are here not to provide a third way, but they're here to provide an additional option uh, to whoever actually countries want to work with them, whether it's the US, China, a number of countries from the so-called global south, a number of countries in Africa and Asia. And this idea is that it's not just an alternative to the US and China, all these options can be cumulative. And so the idea that there are several options out there, this doesn't, you could think that actually it plays maybe into this fragmentation, but I think if we're dealing with this, uh, again, collectively in the international order, this is, the role that Europeans are supposed to play. First of all, they're supposed to take their own role seriously on the international stage. The strategic awakening that the Europeans have been going through is honestly fairly recent. Europeans are still very reluctant to acknowledge themselves, to think of themselves as a global power, as a geopolitical power. It's an ambition of the European Commission, but this is the idea that we would think geopolitically goes completely contrary to how the European Union was set up. So we're overcoming our own difficulties here, but we have a huge tool, which is the single market in the EU, which is our strongest tool and that we need to strengthen and we need to use it actually in, in a more geopolitical way. So we're thinking about how we provide options to a number of countries in the, in the international stage on the multilateral level. This is exactly what the Europeans want to do at a time where they are scared of an increased fragmentation of the world. I would think uh, 20 years down the road, we quite likely are going to have a continuation of the current uh, international system. Uh, there will be modifications. The, the temptation, especially in rhetoric, and mind you, Chinese, American, or Chinese, European, or for that matter, whatever brand, however you pair that rhetoric, there are a lot of echo chamber effect translating back and forth. Uh, you may have that temptation of saying, let's have a bifurcated word, let's have, you know, in reality, doing things uh, to create a new set, separate sets of systems, although, you know. Uh, but how successful can that be? If you look at, uh, you, you will need followers to do that, right? One recent example, in, at least in the past year or past few months, is a number of those countries that were considered pivotal or strategic, uh, strategically important, they choose to join projects, if you know, both provided by the G20 framework or G7 framework and the BRICS framework, or for that matter, the Belt and Road. So the notion that of bifurcation being a viable choice sort of assumes uh, there you, you have third parties or fourth parties that just so willingly and so to uh, follow that kind of so-called leadership and they would not they were not capable of hedging what they don't think about the hedging is probably a more strategic sense 
they, they're short of choices. I think that assumption is just not true. And following that kind of assumption would actually lose, uh, uh, help you know, the party that drives, tries to get a third party say, you know, follow me, not him. <laughs> it's actually a way of losing support around the world. Um, the, the, with just a, a one word about Susan's talk about a reference to the democratization of the international system. That rhetoric needs to be uh, examined. If you look at the Chinese political philosophy, going back to Sun Zhongshan's reference to Tian Xia Da Tong, all nations are equal. To, Mao Zhu, to Chairman Mao's reference to the, the Chinese, China and the Chinese people should make a contribution to mankind, and to what we say today, uh, our leaders say today as a uh, uh, wrongly translated a shared future, I think it's a common future for mankind. It's not really that, it's quite consistent. In other words, it's you know, going round and round probably some, to say the same meaning about cohabitation. Uh, in, uh, the, uh, I, if I can go back a little bit to what I said earlier on, it's probably uh, the, 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 if there is a consistent Chinese position on this that stands the test of time, it's a valuation of intranational relationship. And then on that basis, say, let's work internationally and see how we can... Uh, uh, ameliorate our differences. Differences are always going to be there. Thank you. Always. Thank you. I, Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity to bring our audience in. And, and Susan, you've already sort of briefly commented on this before, that uh, we don't have a choice. We must uh, find a way to cohabit. So we will let that stand. Um, the floor is now open to questions. If we could start with Nicholas. You have a uh, microphone. It's on its way to you. <laughs> All right. Okay. This one works better. All right. Um, I come from the human rights world. Um, I work at Amnesty and Human Rights Watch. So normally I'm the idealist in the room. But today I find myself a little bit in the other camp. Uh, we know that the international system is not fit for purpose. But we also know that this is the nature of institutions. They are sticky, they outlive the conditions of their creation, and they decay and they have problems. So the real question is, are the participants of the system willing to cooperate to reform the institution? And I'd like to know whether you see any um, inkling of that cooperation. All the big parties have different problems and interests and trajectories. The U.S. has an enormous domestic problem, clearly, that could change everything. Uh, the West is generally losing power relatively to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, the EU has a problem because it has not the material means for its security, uh, which is a problem in a more and more brutal world. Um, and China has a problem um, in terms of reforming the international order, which is, I think Susan alluded to it, it's not clear they really want these responsibilities. Um, it seems to me they don't really have the capacity to do it. And with the war of U on Ukraine, the vision that China now pro uh, promotes is a vision of reduced and conditional territorial sovereignty. This is territorial sovereignty, but not if some other parties have legitimate security interests, or probably more accurately uh, translated as reasonable um, uh, security concerns, which is, you know, what, what is this? If my territorial security is guaranteed, but could be waived for some vague principle that, that is pretty worrying, and I don't see any member of the international community saying, well, I'm going to leave the UN Charter and international law to join this function. So my question really is, you know, a lot of what we attribute to China seems to be more uh, on the realm of a quest for status than a quest for actual 
you know, managerial responsibilities of the international system. The, the real question I have is what would, so what we can expect is more decay of the institution and a fragmented order, basically. I, unless there is, you know, a real willingness from the different parties to cooperate despite having different problems and, and uh, options. What would it take for these different parties, US, EU, and China, to really cooperate to reform the international order, and what result could we expect aside from degrading the system to the lowest common denominator? Okay, so I'm going to give each of you a couple of sentences to respond to this so that we can bring in another question. Um, I tried to leave us on an optimistic note about the con continuity of the international system, but uh, we, we must deal with the fact that there is risk of decay as well. So Susan and then John and Tara. I mean, I, what, what resonates <clears throat> about what you said with me is that everyone says that we need to do this, that, and the other thing. You know, we need to tackle climate change. We need to improve the institutions for pandemics. <clears throat> we need to fix the World Bank. But, um, you know, everyone's got different ideas about how to do that, and no one wants to pay. So really, at the end of the day, the international system is about resources. It's about global public goods and who's going to pay for them. And we have more and more needs, and we have more and more reticence about paying. And how are we going to, in the rich countries, you know, figure out how to um, deal with some of this? I mean, um, China is now the number two um, uh, UN dues payer in the system. So in that respect... Uh, we do see some stepping up, um, but we need to see a lot more. And if what we're talking about basically is complaints from, and I don't like the term global south, but I'll use it here, um, complaints from countries that have been neglected in the interests that the international system was established for, which is, which is again, protection of stability and peace and promotion of development and prosperity um, and um, sort of in a sustainable way that takes into account kind of a more global community. And I think they're frustrated. Um, I think, you know, all the major powers are also frustrated, but they, you know, we don't want to give up our privileges in the system either. So, I mean, that I think is why you have to see better cooperation among those major powers. And now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that's gone in the wrong direction. So, you, you know, you're right to be skeptical, but we don't have anything better. I think young people really want to see this global institution working. They see the problems and they're frustrated. And I think that's true for young people around the world, not just, you know, in developed or developing countries. So we have to uh, do better and... Um, you know, I don't think that the direction we've gone in the U.S.-China relationship is going to make this any easier. So maybe step one is we've got to figure out how to get that back on track. And I do think, you know, talking is important and engagement is important. And we see kind of some engagement now getting back on track between the U.S. and China, whether that can go far enough to bring us to some point of cooperation to fix the international system you know, uh, it should, but will it? We don't know yet. Professor Jeff? In the interest of time, I'll be very brief. Uh, China, to the, my knowledge, Chinese government agencies, especially the foreign ministry, came up with various uh, positions on the Russia, Ukraine, and other situations. But then, at the end of the day, for China to play a role, uh, it needs to have a buy-in. Uh, on the direct parties involved in the conflict. In the case of uh, the Iran-Saudi Arabia situation, you know, China tried to play the role. Uh, how would it turn out to be the way it was? It's because of the buy-in. And then that's one point. The second quick point is that you need to bear in mind that when we, you talk about China, you can't just be so abstract how the international system comes to today, the ideals, the laws, the philosophies, the practices, and the accumulation of unwritten expertise dates back to World War I or even before that. For today's China, 
you know, Chinese diplomats, Chinese scholars, Chinese leaders. You know, I've studied. I came to the U.S. back first in the 1980s. As a collective, there is that absence of participation. So uh, naturally, I would say it's not really by design. You know, we would, you would have a representative of a Chinese person, you know, at a table, UN or US, but collectively we don't have that kind of as much rich a collective memory of how the international system has evolved. So that's um, thank you. We have to be a little more patient. So. Final word is to you, Tara. I think Europeans are worried about the low-cost international order that we've been describing right now. And I do think that actually it shouldn't be just about cohabitation, coexistence, but it should be about coexistence in the very long term. And so the need to tackle a number of the global issues we've mentioned. China and Russia are fundamentally opposed to UN uh, Security Council reform. And actually, I don't like the word, the, the expression global south either, but I do think all the countries of the global south and beyond have a lot of agency. And it's much harder for China and Russia uh, basically to say no to them. If a number of these countries go to China and Russia and ask for more representation in the international system, it does break the narrative that it's the West against the rest, particularly since the war in Ukraine. So I would actually call a number of these emerging countries to ask China and Russia to be part of this international system um, and to have their rightful place in it. So that uh, uh, concludes our time, unfortunately. Um, this hour went by faster than I wanted to. I have many more questions to ask. It just means that we're going to have to return to this conversation in the future. But uh, the, the key thing that I left with is that uh, the, the current international system does seem to cohere to the interest of uh, a European perspective, a Chinese perspective, and an American perspective. But there are real impediments to uh, addressing the shortcomings and problems that are going to need to be addressed. And in the absence of that, the risk of decaying in the system is real. So thank you to our panelists uh, for providing their expertise.